Are we recording this at all? <laughs> I mean, we are, but I was just going to cut it. <laughs> Unless you want it for later. <laughs> I mean, it's cool. It's nerdy. <laughs> it's nerdy. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to, like, officially start? We could. It's It's been a while since I've done one of these. I know. That's When I did the one with uh, Brian and Joe the other day, I was like, oh my gosh, it's been forever since I, like, opened one of these. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. It's okay. The opening is kind of like how I do the openings of the one-on-one -on -one interviews I make on my YouTube channel. So I was like, I'll just say the same stuff. It's fine. Oh, <laughs> oh goodness. So hi, everybody. Here we are with yet another nature chat. Um, this one we should have done way earlier, but things got really complicated this year, if you didn't know. Um, so we're finally, finally interviewing Cindy. Yay! We're doing a nature chat Yay. with Cindy. <laughs> yeah! Yay! Uh, so we have a lot to cover with Cindy because she's been in the game for a little while now. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I guess we could start with... Um, uh, I don't know, Peter, where do you want to start with this? There's a whole bunch of different angles of approach here. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I guess we should go with like who Cindy is first. Sure. And uh yeah cindy uh do you want to just like tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started uh <laughs> well i'm uh i guess uh native born texan i'm originally from the houston area from the coast uh galveston county uh from a very nerdy family both my parents are science educators uh now sort of retired and um yeah i've uh it's been so it's a very long season this journey and I'm not done yet but at the moment I'm actually sort of between things um I've done work both in software development and in uh, the arts I've done a lot of theater work uh but at the moment I'm in a little bit of a holding pattern while I work out um I actually got diagnosed with narcolepsy two years ago and I'm still figuring out how that works um so yeah in the meantime I'm doing fun make -em ups with my friends and now with y'all <laughs> Yay! Yeah, yeah. How I wanted to ask, um, just for our viewers' edification, how how did you get roped into Nature Check? How did you find oh. out about us? <laughs> uh, so uh, the the other stream that is currently on hiatus until it's safe for eight people to be in the same room in Austin, Texas again. Um, uh, that's oh, on the Weird Things channel. Isn't it? uh, it's huh it would be nine people right? oh yeah well to be <laughs> to be fair uh elizabeth and and uh yeah. and the baby uh hide upstairs um during the show uh with the very noisy cat mm -hmm. um <laughs> poor cat she's just starved for attention it's adorable um but yeah i play uh with the heroes of awesome constellation which is doing the star trek uh rpg from um, uh, modiphius and uh at some point so on that i'm playing the chief engineer um and at some point uh during one of the games we had uh the chief medical officer and i think our commander and a couple other people involved trying to have this whole conversation and figure out this puzzle that involved genetics and i'm sitting there just dying because like cindy the human player knows much more about genetics than Izzy, the Andorian engineer, with a medicine score of one, which in that <laughs> game is zero low. Um, and so sort of what happens when one of us isn't really doing anything in the game, because that's pretty frequent, is we'll actually get on the Twitch chat and talk to the people who are there. And the Weirdlings channel has quite a few followers, including a one roving naturalist. Oh, it's me. Uh, <laughs> and so at some point I got on there and a couple people were already sort of talking about like, the stuff that they were clearly didn't know and so i sort of got on i was like yeah i know this is making me crazy uh, and we just started chatting and having a real good little fun time in the chat room and uh and then that turned into at some point because i think mark recognized you was like oh yeah she runs her own rpg or she runs her own dd campaign it's uh it's a bunch of it's called it's called uh nature check and it's got a bunch of like, naturalists and uh i think his line uh, was something like it was scientist friends yeah he was like oh that's cheryl she runs the game with a bunch of scientist friends because then jordan was like i want scientist friends and i was in the chat and then like in the youtube comments being like jordan you can have scientist friends message me like we will be friends with you right <laughs> 
so yeah, then that turned into a sort of a someday invite that turned into a March invite. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been great having you. And a good storyteller. (laughs) Absolutely. So, okay. Some of the theater that I did was... Mm -hmm. Don't let me interrupt you. I was going to say some of the theater that I did was improv. And so that's sort of how I ended up there, which is then how I ended up here. So. Well, then you're better prepared than everyone on Nature Check, I think, for... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for for D&D. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um so I guess that's a great lead in to to talking about Nadia. Like how how did you create Nadia, your your character on a nature check? Um well, we had sort of talked about uh if I wanted to be a helper or an antagonist, and I said helper. Um and then sort of based on sort of areas that I do know some about um, sort of landed on pollution. Um, That's something, so my dad's an environmental toxicologist. And so I grew up learning all about all the various terrible things that we do to our environment. And, uh, and there was already the thing with the bad fish and the poison river. And so we decided it would be a character that was involved in that. And from there, I think Cheryl gave me an option of two different kinds of water beings and i don't remember what the other one was but the method looked much more entertaining um and part of the draw actually was the fact that she does have uh intelligence six uh so i have izzy the hyper competent uh engineer on the star trek game and then i also play a firefly game where i accidentally made another character who's just a hyper competent engineer and both of them have like these really complex family background things and i was like okay i want two things i don't want to have to be the smartest person in the room (laughs) and no family (laughs) because when i made those characters i was like i hate that gaming trope of like everyone's like an orphan like no that stinks you should have someone who comes from a relatively healthy balanced (laughs) and and it's like oh people with relatively healthy balanced backgrounds don't leave home yeah, to, go, to go become mercenaries I mean, or whatever. Cedric yeah. and Fletcher both had like happy family lives and they went off yeah. to be adventurers. But yeah. I'll say for Cedric, I, I am like, oh my God, I need to go back and listen to everything so that I can write down all the stupid things that so like much, all the family yeah. members that I made. But, but in the, Why did I do this the, to myself? The four of you, we have two people with like full and complete families as far as I know. And then we have two people who are mm-hmm. complete orphans. So I guess there's, you know... There's a total of four players and four parents, and then there's Nadia. <laughs> <laughs> Who there's may have a totally spirit. complete family, but they're just trapped on a different elemental plane. Right. So we don't have... Yeah. yeah. Well, they're not, not trapped. An issue at the She's moment. trapped. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, my well, gosh. Great. They're well, probably so worried. <laughs> Someday I'll roleplay I mean, your frantic parents. have been worried for a very long yeah. time. <laughs> so... Uh, have we have we talked about your experience with uh, the first like when you came on to Nature Check for the first episode that you were on? Have we talked? I mean, I know we've talked about that like off stream, but I don't think we've ever talked about that on stream. I don't, I don't and think I we feel have. like that's pretty excellent. Uh, it a little was bit of so funny. <laughs> um, like by the time I left that day, my face was hurting because I'd been like laughing Same. and smiling so long. Uh, yeah, so I was sitting literally right beside Cheryl for that whole game, obviously. Um, headphones on so I could listen in, but then like was being quiet when she was talking and you mute frequently enough that it actually was real easy to like have these little side conversations. Um, but sometimes also like typing or writing stuff down. Um, and you guys took forever off that <laughs> boat. And the friends that were hosting uh, were walking by with like a notebook with like paper on it that said three hour tour and just <laughs> parading across the room, like right in front of us every once in a while. I feel like it was exceptional uh, so yeah, we for them to good only hear our half of the conversation, right? Like they couldn't hear what everybody else was doing. So, Yeah. <laughs> and it was just, oh man, it was so funny. But what was it like, um, I mean, I was there and like, I heard you, you know, coming up with ideas, but like, what did it feel like to be sort of like, uh, listening to them messing around, waiting to get to your part. And then also like when we finally did get to the part where you were interacting with them, but they didn't know it. Like, what was that like to, you know, sort of have the opportunity to mess with them off screen? 
Yeah, it was funny because like the first thing was like, you know, I tried to hide and someone rolled a crazy high check to spot me. So that was so it was sort of I had this whole like sort of entrance thing in my head and that just went immediately out the window because you knew there was someone there. Um, and then and yeah, just following along and like this conversation y'all were having at the time, I'm going, <laughs> I'm supposed to be deciding I want to hang out with these people and they're literally talking out loud about killing fish people. <laughs> like that's why i even asked i was like did they just say that out loud and cheryl asked me like yeah sure it's like <laughs> <laughs> so then it being just little things of sort of you know like someone said they were hungry and i was like oh i can drop them some food except what i dropped was uncooked cashews and then um <laughs> yeah just sort of just sort of this let's I guess sort of the justification in my head was like, let's see what these guys are all about. And, you know, if they're going to make it out here by themselves, I'm not <laughs> sure. Um, so it was yeah. touch and go there for a while. <laughs> yeah. But I also, I 100% did not know the deal about the birds. I didn't know that they were so dangerous. And so it's just like, well, we need to find these birds. And I was like, oh, I know where the birds are. And so I like dropped the the breadcrumb feathers and you just followed him right in and <laughs> it's act and i was just like whoops <laughs> I mean, you wanted to find the birds i have technically help. they didn't attack they were defending themselves sure sure somebody, whatever you want to say call it threw cheryl a rock out of a sling at them somebody threw a somebody rock at them. i don't know who uh, like you know that was so long you ago I, I really don't remember either um <laughs> Anybody in the party could use a sling. Who 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 mm -hmm, knows? Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, that reminds me. You guys still haven't gotten any birds or feathers. Yeah. No. <laughs> I kind of figure that'll be a on the way back thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm kind of hoping so. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Once we're powerful enough to face a bunch of birds. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, once we're like level 10, you had to go grind go before you could <laughs> yeah. fight the parrots. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> whatever. <laughs> Those are some really intimidating birds. Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly intimidated by them. <laughs> Someday I'll finally be able to tell everyone what they are. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. It's a. Well, it's a. I didn't a, realize it was a thing. Well, it's a thing out of the monster manual. I'm sure everybody will be excited Ooh. to hear, you know, the reveal of the monster name. But man, I, I am glad that I am so bad at remembering things out of the monster manual. It makes it very easy not to metagame. <laughs> well, they're they're not out of the first monster manual. See, this version of D and D has five monster manuals, oh, and a okay. lot of the Wait stuff in the like second, third, fourth, and fifth are like. Like, the first monster manual is so vanilla. Like, <laughs> the things in the second, third, fourth, and fifth are, like, way out there. Like, really creative and very exciting. So, yeah, I read through cover to cover, well, front page to back page of the PDFs, all five of them, and pulled out every monster that was, like, kind of nature-related that I thought I could populate this world with. And oh the gosh. birds made it in early. How many is that so just like many. ballpark you, <laughs> like you that's would gotta like to be... see my excel spreadsheet yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are a uh, grade a nerd cheryl i will get or uh, i will give that to you Bing? you're 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 very it used welcome. to be a bad thing now it's a good thing <laughs> oh absolutely absolutely especially on nature it was never actually a bad thing well no. yeah okay that's fair <laughs> <laughs> speaking of nerds um I would like to know, because I have enjoyed watching you on the uh, Weirdlings Star Trek so much, I would like to know um, more about, like, how you make decisions about your role-playing, and then also, what part of, like, you yourself can, do you find that you're, like, incapable of extricating from your characters? So, like, what do you think Nadia and Izzy um, have in common, even though you tried to make them very different? Um... Man, there's not much in common. Um, I think I think what maybe the the one thing I kind of can't extricate is just that uh, need to sort of take care of the group because uh, that's just something that I always do. Um, I basically took on the role of sort of soccer mom among my friends in college. I was the one with the car. 
Um, so it was a lot of like, hey, we need to go do something. Yeah, sure, I'll drive. But that included the, uh, you know, those moments when you start turning into your parents. Uh, there was a moment very early on, like when I first got the car in college, where I had a bunch of friends in the car and two of them are like, poking at each other in the back seat and it was really distracting and I ended up saying this thing that my mother always used to say to us because there are three of us and it was no body contact sports in the car and suddenly <laughs> I understood it and I was like oh that's a good rule mom and then that was a part of that was like I finally had to be like okay we got a few ground rules in the car and they mostly center around not startling the driver while she's driving <laughs> um, I love that line yeah. so much it's so good. Oh, she's got so, oh, she, she grew up, she grew up around Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and she's just got, I think her parents had. What's that? Sorry, my microphone and speaker did the weird thing where it just like Zoom just like forgets how to use them for a minute. Um oh. That's so fun. I heard the my mom's from Winston Winston Salem and then it cut out. <laughs> so oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just she's from Winston Salem, North Carolina, so she's got all kinds of good little folksy things like that. <laughs> I am super excited for when you when you break and you say that to probably Cedric and Lucanus. Probably. Just gonna assume <laughs> oh. <laughs> No body contact <laughs> sports on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> If you ever make yeah. it back been, to the boat. God. I have actually really been enjoying uh, just kind of getting to simplify things for Nadia's perspective. Uh, it's just been, it's been really funny. So even occasionally Cheryl will give me more information and then I will relay it in a very like plain spoken kind <laughs> totally. of way. It's like the big hairy one, small angry one. <laughs> I loved that a lot, though. Yeah, that yeah. that yeah. you take the information and sort of like not just not just make it your own, but like make it yeah exactly the way the character would phrase it. Like I think this character has a great voice, not voice like mm -hmm. the sound of your voice, but voice is in like the way you speak. Yeah, the sound of your voice is good yeah. too. I mean, that, that, <laughs> I just meant she wasn't like affecting a yeah. like a sound of the voice, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think that's tried to figure out a character voice and just didn't. Couldn't come up with one. They're hard to maintain. I think it's great. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm I'm very bad with that. I I do no. I I wanted to chime in and say I also appreciate Nadia's voice um, because I feel like often when you're the character that has more backstory, it's like the DM is like, here's a one minute explanation that everyone sits through, and then you're like, I say that, <laughs> but instead Nadia can kind of do I say that, but in one mm -hmm. sentence, you know, yeah. um, which I think is, is, it makes it fun to, allows you to actually role play that without yeah. being redundant. Um, so. Yeah, one of the other uh, nice things about Nadia versus Izzy in the Star Trek game is, uh, is that she's just got a much brighter outlook on life. <laughs> Whereas I ended up sort of rolling, it started off being a little bit like it was like sort of the backstory was a little bit sad and there was a little bit of sort of some of my neuroses built in there. And then I just sort of accidentally stumbled into like, oh no, she's putting on a good face. She's actually much more messed up, um, but totally in denial and doesn't know it. Um, well, we also so, can't ignore that. And that's that, been like, interesting. Yeah, sorry. I, I was going to say, we also can't ignore that. Like a lot of really dark stuff has happened to Izzy on screen which like doesn't help yeah probably. and that's the other thing yeah so like she's so in addition to sort of finally having to face sort of that backstory that she had sort of put on the back burner for a long time because she was far away from everything and it didn't really matter and then suddenly like being forced to so so she has the the we were supposed to build in several secrets for our characters from the beginning and one of mine was uh, that Izzy actually has a family. And boy, oh boy, did I write myself into a fun pickle because it turns out Andorians in Star Trek canon, uh, the bond groups are four, not two. So now we have four spouses, parents, and then um, 
And then at the time that we've got it set, which is sort of at the overlap between Next Generation and DS9, um, they're actually sort of at the peak of a population crisis because there's been some genetic drift that has made them only able to reproduce in a very narrow window. So if you got to have four kids just for population replacement, and then like most families weren't able to produce that many in the small window. So it's an interesting thing. They uh, they did something kind of cool with it in the novels um, a few years past the point that we're at um, with Bashir, of course. Um, but it's made for this really interesting and extremely complicated dynamic because now it's also, oh, she can't be an only child and she can't have only one child. And so it's this whole, like the family tree, just writing up what, what happened in the two months between the end of our first season and the beginning of our second, because I had Izzy go home, now I have to update where everyone is. And that was literally two pages. Just that. <laughs> So, yeah. So I'm excited <laughs> to not have to track that much background with Nadia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I've always felt like the Andorians were a race that um, uh, didn't get enough attention in the TV show. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, Enterprise like went back and, you know, yeah. reclaimed and them from much... the trash bin, but it still wasn't wasn't enough. There's so yeah. much going on there. Yeah. Well, and it's very much a function of the makeup technology. I mean, what's cool about it, because you can see it as you go through the different iterations, like they can't show the Andorians for very long in the older up in the older series because like those antenna aren't gonna do anything, you know? <laughs> um and now they've got the technology to do it either with really good animatronics and makeup or with CG. Um, and to their credit, I think Discovery used animatronics. Um, and I'm pretty sure Enterprise did as well. And so, like, suddenly we can now tell these stories. And they built this really interesting culture to contrast with the Vulcans and also sort of show what sort of other parties had to be involved for, you know, the humans and Vulcans to come together and start the Federation. And so you've got the Tellarites, uh, who are another just amazing, wonderful type of... Uh, species and the andorians with their culture and yeah i was just like i because because i did watch all of enterprise um and really loved what they did with shran there and was like i want to do that one <laughs> then after that i read up for the on the 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 just buck wild cultural stuff and was like oh Oops. <laughs> well, so the other weird cultural thing about Andorians that I, I felt like was a great reason to have you fit into this show is because you did so much research on how Izzy would experience food. And I swear this cast talks about food so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I especially love the idea of like, Nadia's just been living out in this jungle for a very long time now, and she obviously knows how to survive on her own. So she's just like, yeah, you eat that and you eat that. And like, it's been funny going through some of the druid stuff and going, oh, this will work fine. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a very lot good of, you, need to, you need to know nature around you. And I was like, yeah, this will this work. So, OK, behind the, the character of Nadia, um, like, do you feel like being trapped in the jungle by herself for a very long time, like, it doesn't seem like it's affected Nadia, right? Like, I, I feel like if I was going to write a care, you know, if Cedric was trapped in the jungle for a very long time, he would come out like Robin Williams' character in Jumanji, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> but Nadia's just like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, sort of in my mind. So for one thing, there are other beings in the jungle that she has been able to communicate with. I mean, she was there basically seeing friends at the time she got trapped. Um, and then, so there's still that, but she's also, just the way I've sort of got her in my mind, she's very, um, she's just kind of aloof. And so she's able to just sort of entertain herself. And her approach basically was like sort of, cautiously sort of scout out the area and then figure out where she could be safe and then just stay there and she's been perfectly happy just sort of poking around just existing 
Um, cause she certainly doesn't have any ideas for how to get back. Like that's clearly beyond her. Um, <laughs> because it's beyond everyone right now. Right. <laughs> um, and she's just the kind of optimistic spirit that, uh, is just making the best of it. Um, and like part of her reason for like needing to seek out others is that like, there's this, there's a major problem with the river, which is a major part of her habitat. Um, plus, like, where her friends live. So, yeah. Makes sense. So, how old is Nadia? <laughs> you know, she's got to be at least 100, right? Uh, yeah, I think the, the loss happened like 86 or 90 years ago, something like that. Um, so, yeah, we sort yeah. of waved our hands over that, but I feel like the other good explanation here is that, like, I am certainly not going to be the first DM to say this, that, like, time works differently on different planes. So, like, you know, she might be yeah. this many years old in this plane, but, like, on the plane of water, she would be a different amount of age. So, you know, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. I, Yeah, we never addressed it, and I figured that was probably for the best. Well, Something, and something magic creatures. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. know if this is something that we've talked about on Nature Check before, but um, it's definitely something that comes up in discussions of how different races or species age in um, in D and D, where like people of equivalent um, maturity are different age, right? right. Um, and I think different people think like, well, you know, so a, an elf might not be considered mature until they're I don't know what. 60 something like that um lucianus is over a hundred years old but he is equivalent in age to cedric who's around 30 and to k who's around 17 18 fletcher right. is the old person in the group <laughs> yeah, that's so that's so it's like a prolonged adolescence is kind of the standard mm -hmm. in D, D. um yeah i think uh, which is is true in in real life for you know for some species i mean humans have the most prolonged adolescence of any animal uh, that exists on earth um but there's a difference between having a prolonged adolescence and having a long lifespan right they, like you think some mm -hmm. animals have a very short adolescence so like even though like i think humans and dwarves and elves in D, &D have uh their adolescence basically matches up as a percentage of their lifespan mm -hmm. to their overall age. But I think if you were to redesign how those species work, it would make complete sense to just be like, yeah, when dwarves turn 18, they're considered adult dwarves and then they live for another 300 mm -hmm. years after that or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, that's all, that's a long way of kind of circling back to like the idea that like Nadia could still be an adolescent Mm -hmm. You know, that or maybe yeah. adolescent lasts for hundreds of years as a water method. And then you're a mature, you know, maybe you're the equivalent of a periodical cicada where you're <laughs> immature for 90% of your life. And then <laughs> you're like, when yeah. I turn 900, I'm going to find a mate <laughs> oh, and then die. I don't, think, uh, I don't think the book entry actually had anything about method age, which was part of the reason that we were like, That's, it's fine. I, like, <laughs> Yeah, I went looking for it specifically just to be sure that we didn't have to have some sort of hand wavy thing or take like certain disadvantages because they do have an aging mechanism in the game. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah uh, the <laughs> other yeah the other thing I was kind of thinking was she was probably fairly young when she got stuck. So it's sort of the equivalent of you know well kind of like the guy in Jumanji who you know went over as a kid and wasn't done yet. <laughs> and just is kind of figuring things given what I do know of the world now. Right. Yeah. The most transformative yeah. spring break. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Pretty much. So is this your first time playing 3-5? You were talking about mechanics in the yes. game. Yeah. Yeah. How do you like it compared so, to... Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, if I didn't have so much spare time, it would be a problem. Um, <laughs> but... Um, Are you I've actually there's a lot been of really enjoying, yeah, I've actually been enjoying sort of the nuances of it and just having something to kind of sink my teeth into and learn, um, because I haven't really had a lot of that in the last several years. So it's been, 
it's been it's been a nice challenge. I will say there was a moment when I started looking into the druid stuff a few weeks ago when I kind of went, what have I done? Um, <laughs> but I I feel a lot better about it now. Um, there's a lot to play with, and I'm the kind of weirdo who enjoys an opportunity to, uh, you know, pull out a bunch of index cards and colored pens and start writing out spell yes. cards. So yes, <laughs> yes. <Amazing. laughs> I was like, I started to go buy some, and then I went, wait, I know I have these. <laughs> <laughs> I have a whole little case and everything. Um, that would be me. I know I have them, but I don't know where they are, and it would take me a year to find them, so I guess I'll just buy some more. Well, also, you're moving. Well, and the reason, and the reason that I had them was for some theater stuff that I'm not going to have any use for for a while, so... Right, right. So, yeah, even though um, spellcasting classes in this version of the game are or can be a little complicated or require a lot of reading, um, I guess, like, you told me that Druid was of interest to you when Nadia had a chance to level up, but I don't know that we really talked about, like, what motivated you to pick Druid. Uh, mostly the challenge, just because <laughs> I knew that Druid was uh, part, of, part of it was just that there weren't many classes that felt like a good fit for that kind of character. Um... But then also, like, sort of the next most obvious one would have been Ranger. And, like, that's the other class that I've played in D&D. &D. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Rangers. Because the other thing with Ranger is it gets old fast. Mm. Yeah. You can do some cool stuff. Like, it's really great for lower level. And then you sort of watch everyone else get all these really cool powers and stuff. And then you're just like, hey. That's why I'm such a big fan of... I can do of... one more thing talking to animals. That's why I'm such a big fan of prestige classes, because I think that, uh, like, there are... Ranger is certainly one class where that can happen, but there are several others where, like, oh, it kind of feels repetitive unless you, like, really specialize or customize your character quite a bit. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that's kind of helping as I look at the, the druid stuff is, like, again, through the lens of Nadia with her limitations... There's a lot of those classes that just wouldn't make sense for her. So, or a lot of those those spells or a lot of those other feats and stuff that I was just like, no, this is going to be easy enough because it's going to be like, these are this is the path that makes sense. Um, and that certainly helps a lot. Mm. Um, it, and it yeah, does, as far as just... I was just going to say, it does feel like a natural character, fit to me. Yeah. Yeah. And this feels uh, especially topical. I didn't know that it was going to be so important so fast, but how do you both feel about having some backup on healing and not being the only divine caster in this rather uh, accident-prone party? <laughs> Boy, that sure was convenient, wasn't it? It came in clutch immediately, <laughs> oh which I was not yeah. expecting. <laughs> oh well, yeah. and the hilarious thing was I hadn't, actually looked up any of the spells yet before that game like that particular week it ended up getting really crazy and like i literally sat down to look at stuff like four or five times in the two week break between those games and every single time either something came up or just yeah like it just didn't happen and so at the end of that game when like the cleric is down and cheryl's just like well <clears throat> you might check out your spells <laughs> 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 yeah it, it was it was a nail biter there for a bit <laughs> we'll also um, say that the death mechanic in 3.5 is really interesting i actually like like it's much more nuanced than it is in five and i was reading through that and going oh this is cool just from this completely just nerdy viewpoint i shared it with uh one of my friends who's on the the star trek game with me who's currently playing um uh five game and like I think I sent him a screenshot of the page and he was just like no no <laughs> but it's cool right no <laughs> I know I've said yeah. this multiple times but I just like really appreciate healing and dying in 3-5 so much more because it feels so much like you said nuanced or realistic that like oh mm -hmm. if I like if I go to if, well if I was in combat today and somebody like cut my arm really badly like I'm not gonna wake up tomorrow and the cut to just be gone right yeah. and same yeah. thing like in 3.5, I told you guys it was actually to your benefit that you had so much longer to die than in 5th, right? So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I like I like all yeah. of that more nuanced and slower approach, because you die slower, but you also heal slower. Yeah, you also heal slower, which that's kind of worrying, but then again, I've also got uh, that rapid heal 
thing. <laughs> so I'm a lot less worried about that than I would be. Because <laughs> it's basically yeah, great like, for oh, you. it rained? Cool. I went outside and slept in the rain. I'm better. Well, now it's good for all of you because if one of the two party healers has fast healing. Yeah. No, it's, it's, really it's fabulous. Really good for you and complicated for me. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think it's... It's one of those things that it, it, it kind of has to tie into, like slow healing, I I agree. It it makes the game feel more real. And it's one of those things that it has to tie into your DM style as well, right? Because it can mm -hmm. be the kind of thing where it can make the game feel more of a um, a slog or it can add tension to the, the story progression and make it feel much more uh i don't know uh high stakes um and so i think it, mm -hmm. it it all boils down to like yeah whether yeah i think that's a good point i think it also um like i mean i'm dming this game but i've also played three five and i think that it changes how you act as a player like i've noticed a lot of fifth ed groups tend to be a little more like murder hobo-y and i don't know if that's because they're mostly new players or if it's because it feels like oh, we'll just take a long rest or we'll take a short rest and roll some hit die and everything will be better. Whereas like in 3.5, you have to be like, well, no, maybe let's not have combat two days in a row because I didn't get all my hit points back yet. And so like you sort of, like, again, it feels like more realistic, right? If you were a, you know, a knight in ye olde whenever times, like you wouldn't fight every day because you die that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and like our tank has crazy high hit points but it's going to take a while to get them back up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, cool, we can throw him at this thing today, but then he won't be back to full strength for a few days. I just pictured Nadia literally throwing Lucanus and it was delightful. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because you're such different sizes. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, I don't, is her strength high enough for that? <laughs> <laughs> I my my imagination is Nadia flying and picking up uh, yes. Lucanus from like the like his belt loops, <laughs> carrying. Him. Anything's possible uh, with a high enough roll. I guess. It's true. It's true. Uh, oh man, I still Ryan getting that natural twenty on that last hit. Oh God, yeah, that was so incredible. That 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 session from the beginning to the end, like going in, being like, "All right, the the cleric and the wizard are both down, and what's gonna happen?" To to yeah, yeah Ryan getting that that natural twenty. Oh, it was so good. Well, and I went in, you know, basically like I'd done my homework. I made sure I understood all the like uh, all of the death and and healing rules and I made sure that I understood how all the spells worked and I like even like sat down and prepped these are the spells I prepped this morning um and basically there was a very simple uh two-part strategy one was heal the cleric the second one was protect the cleric and then I almost died before I got to the first one and then I did die before I got to the second it was just like <laughs> yeah yeah that was very self-sacrificing of nadia like i mean i mean you had two for the survival of the group but it also like i mean you you went i mean like you could have bailed you know like uh i mean i don't think that's in nadia's spirit but yeah i don't think it's in her spirit and also like she really does need help fixing the river so but also like y'all are all seeing she's got <laughs> how the group has been yeah, y'all are all she's got, and like she she's concerned because you guys are clearly struggling out here. So you know she wants to she wants to help. Well, it's it's good she wants to help because otherwise we would all be dead several times. <laughs> Watching that through on the playback yeah. and how everybody's arms went up when Fletcher got the natural twenty it was like really wonderful for me, and I thought that was gonna be my favorite thing. But then like my actual favorite part was how y'all were like you know, almost falling over, breathing heavy, like, so many people are, you know, on their last, like, st string of life, and then Kay is like, I'm fine. And I was just like... <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kay, Kay's whole character is, is definitely interesting, uh, and I think it's gonna be really, uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how she grows and, and develops as a person. Mm -hmm. Um... Because there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. 
Yeah. Since we just said uh, y'all are all Nadia's got and she wants to keep you alive to help her with the river problem, Nadia, do you, like, have evaluations or, like, particular feelings about the other members of this group you're with? <laughs> and, like, how have um... those maybe evolved since you first met them and they were talking about killing fish people? <laughs> well, on that particular front, I think she's she she feels more comfortable that they're that they're not sort of as bad as that conversation made them sound. <laughs> um and I I think she really like appreciates uh how y'all have just sort of uh you know brought her into the fold and especially taking care of her because again like she she basically got uh Cedric back up to stable and awake and then went down um but part of that was sort of you know the understanding that like yeah i'm pretty sure he's gonna he's gonna take care of me um i'm pretty sure Very and then trusting. just yeah i think sort of i think there's still a bit of trying to protect them from themselves um given given some of the situations we've gotten into you know stuff like there was there was at least one moment of sort of translating something with the, the myconids. I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, but there was just sort of a moment of like, no, y'all aren't y'all aren't getting it. Like, this is how this works. Um, but then also like there's definitely from the beginning been like this concern for Kay and just kind of, you know, seeing that she doesn't seem to be super happy to be out here so maybe kind of make sure that nothing else bad happens um because that's sort of where some of the you know sort of showing where to find the food out here and you know trying to make things seem less scary as well as i ended up one of the things i i i threw at the group when i was trailing you before before y'all before we all caught up to each other was um was it one of the birds or one of, there was an animal or something i'm trying to remember what it was and uh, i was like hey look at my friend and then Kay was terrified of it um <laughs> i think you like you startled a harpy eagle out of a tree and it was carrying a monkey because i remember like she still screams about the harpy eagle and a monkey like once per episode yeah. when y'all are in the rainforest <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm trying to remember i'm trying to remember if the the because there was like an anti oh no a tapir, oh, it, right? um there was a there was a giant anteater and there was a tapir so yeah the, okay <laughs> there were yeah i think one things. of those i was somehow involved in but yeah. but also just seeing that like you know so trying to sort of show that like no that's not a scary thing it's a friend <laughs> uh yeah i can't imagine being actually afraid of a tapir they're so adorable they're so cute so cute <laughs> Now that now that I think about it, I think you're right. It was the giant anteater because she like hid behind Lucanus because giant anteaters are giant, like oh, yeah. big. enormous, yeah, and she was like big. losing her mind. Oh, and then and then when you were finally with them, you were like, oh, it eats bugs, little bugs, and then she like lost her shit again because she was like, oh, the parrots are dangerous, but the giant scary thing eats ants. And, like, yeah, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. But I, I loved that too, your explanation of an anteater. It's just like, it eats bugs, little bugs. Like, that was so good. <laughs> little ones. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um. man. Mm hmm. So, uh, Cindy, do you want to talk about any aspect of science or anything like that that you're particularly interested in? Want to talk about it in? Uh, yeah, I actually thought I would take advantage of the opportunity to talk a little bit about narcolepsy. Um, Excellent. I didn't, I didn't want to ask because I didn't know yeah. if, it was, if it was like something you wanted to talk about yeah. more, but I was hoping you would say that. It actually is. Um, so it basically, it took me a decade from the first time that I had a doctor who was pretty sure they recognized it until I actually got diagnosed. Um. And at that point, it had been 10 years from when I first started falling asleep in classes in school. And that was sixth grade. I was like 12. Um, so that was all that was completely after my education, because I finally saw a doctor after I had just massively struggled through college. Um, and that's actually pretty standard. There are a lot of people that it can take literal decades to get diagnosed. And that's mostly because it's not very well known. 
and very poorly understood. And so, um, yeah, I've been researching it a lot, mostly just to sort of arm myself, um, because it's sort of required some very fundamental shifts to the way I think about living the rest of my life. Um, but then also being able to talk about it uh, might help someone else, you know, either help people to understand someone they know or actively help someone uh, actually get, get diagnosed earlier because uh, it's a very frustrating process. Well, what do you think, like, is there, is there something that you wish that um, somebody had told you earlier? You know, if somebody had t come to you 10 years ago and said, did you know? Yeah. Oh, I literally, there was a point a few months ago where I kind of realized, you know, you always get asked that opening in question like oh if you could go back in time and tell your younger self anything what would it be and i just had this moment of realization that oh obviously i would go back to myself in high school and say you have narcolepsy you should get that taken care of. like you should start dealing with that now because it's going to affect the rest of your life um because it did ultimately end up impacting a lot of my education. Um, I had originally intended to go into engineering and was already struggling with staying awake in classes enough that both my grades had started to drop at the end of high school. And then I just was really struggling to understand new concepts um, because I couldn't, uh, concentration, focus, and memory are all very strongly affected. Um, because the, the net result of narcolepsy is basically, um, you're basically sleep deprived perpetually. Um, so just imagine, uh, pulling an all nighter, uh, or, you know, like dead week in college when you've, you know, you basically haven't gotten enough sleep for like three or four days in a row. Um, that level of tired at all times. Um, and so that level of loss of mental focus, um, and there's a lot of the mechanism of memory retention and filing that happens during the different stages of sleep. And so, um, so basically the, what narcolepsy is, um, there's a particular neurochemical in your brain that um, is tied to the circadian rhythm um, and the sleep-wake cycle uh, called, uh, it's got two names because two different groups of scientists uh, identified it within a couple months of each other and they each came up with their own name and there has not really been a consensus since then, um, <laughs> but it's called, um, it's called hypocretin or orexin. Um, and that's basically, it's based in, I think the hypothalamus, I have taken copious notes because I can't hold things in my brain at all. Um, but yeah, it basically, it's, it functions purely within the brain. So it's not one that goes out to the rest of the body like other hormones. Um, and it works as both a neurotransmitter and a neuromodulator. And it's really fascinating, all this different stuff that it does. And the science is still fairly new. A lot of this has happened in the 2000s. Um, so they're still trying to figure out how it all works. But the short version is it controls the switch in the brain that determines whether you're awake or asleep. And if you're asleep, what part of sleep you're in. Um, so this particular chemical isn't produced enough. Like there's, uh, it's usually an autoimmune response. Occasionally it can just be something that's damaged um, that causes that switch to be faulty. It's basically just a sad little leaky, leaky valve kind of situation. So, so I dip in and out of different stages of sleep and wakefulness 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so that means that during the day, I can be hit with sleep attacks. Um, and at night, I have really disrupted sleep because instead of, you know, awake, level one, level two, deep sleep, REM, like there's this nice stair step that you're supposed to see on the hypnogram. 
and instead it just kind of spikes. Um, and the way that that ends up appearing to the person is this really weird group of uh, symptoms because you get um, excessive daytime sleepiness is the obvious one, but that can also take the form of sleep attacks where you basically have this just really insatiable, like it, it feels like a physical pressure on the brain. So if you've ever been up for way too long and you feel really tired all of a sudden, and it kind of feels like something literally pushing on your brain, like that's what a sleep attack feels like. And that can hit at literally any time. Um, and there are certain things that can be done to help with that. Um, but ultimately there's the, for just everything overall, there's no actual treatment for the problem yet. Like they're still kind of working on it. Um, but yeah, so all of these symptoms have to be sort of treated individually. So one is excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, the other things that happen because you can sometimes drop into, especially REM sleep, um, which is the portion of sleep where you dream, um, that can end up doing some interesting things. So one of the features of REM sleep is that your uh, body goes into sleep paralysis because the idea is you don't want to be acting out what you're dreaming while you're asleep and not aware of your surroundings. Sure. Um, so uh, sleep paralysis can occur. That's usually pretty close to when you're already falling asleep or waking up. Um, but that can be really scary because like, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't move at all. Um, and then um, uh, there are also, there's another feature called cataplexy that um, is sort of like that, only instead of like when you're already like coming in or out of sleep, uh, just if you have a really strong emotional response to something, um, you can just suddenly lose muscle tone. So it actually actually looks to outsiders a lot like a seizure um but uh the but the person stays conscious the whole time so and sometimes it's something as simple as like knees buckling fortunately my cataplexy is very very light um so that's pretty much the most that i get you know sometimes if i'm laughing real hard my face will kind of sag in a weird way um but there are people who will just completely lose muscle tone in their entire body um and that's any strong emotion. So if you're shocked, if you're laughing really hard at something, if you get very angry, um, so anything that really gets you worked up, uh, some people with narcolep narcolepsy with cataplexy uh, can have these just extremely uh, severe cataplexy events. And that means that they can't drive, they can't, you know, they have to spend their entire life sort of checking out their surroundings and going, okay, can I get to the other side of the room without potentially harming myself if something makes me fall over. Um, and so that can be really debilitating. Um, and that's, you know, and that's one, a lot of people, when they think of narcolepsy, they think of, you know, like the character from Moulin Rouge who just falls over asleep all the time. So that's sort of where that idea comes from, but it's really incorrect. Cause again, like they're fully conscious, they just can't move. And it like passes quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's real scary because again, you're in your body and you have no control over it for a second or for up to a minute usually. Um, and then the fourth um, really identifiable symptom is uh, on the other side of that. So uh, if you go into REM sleep rapidly from being awake, uh, you can basically start dreaming uh, while you're still awake. Uh, so that either means, so we've got hypnagogic or hypnopompic uh, hallucinations. And so hypnagog, or sorry, hypnagogic, there we are with the words that I read many times and in my head before I actually learned how to pronounce it. Um, but hypnagogic means it's as you're falling asleep and then hypnopompic is as you're waking up. Um, and I actually have some pretty clear memories from college of, because I was sitting in all these classrooms trying desperately to stay awake and um, suddenly the professor would be talking about something very strange that had nothing to do with the subject matter. Um, or I'd see something weird in the room with us and go, does anyone else see the, and then realize, oh, I'm, I'm falling asleep. Um, at which point, so there was, uh, the one that I remember really clearly was uh, my Cal one professor who was just wonderful. And we do all sort of weird things worked in the lesson when we were talking about exponential growth, talked about tribbles, 
Um, and then at some point, one of the lessons diverted into like the things that knights need to like this very specific materials that are needed to fight dragons most effectively but it wasn't like a math thing it was like a magic thing and i was i just kind of had this moment of that doesn't seem right <laughs> and <laughs> and sort of that's the moment when i realized that oh i'm falling asleep and i jerk awake drop my pen you know try not to knock over my cup of coffee on the desk um so that was when i then first had a doctor mention narcolepsy to me and I went and looked it up. I was like, oh my God, that's what that was. Um, and I did some research at the time, but not nearly enough um, because, you know, what he told me was, well, you don't quite meet the definition because I had done I, the, the process of diagnosis. You can have a clinical diagnosis. It's just based on descriptions, um, but then for insurance purposes you have to do a sleep study um and that usually ends up having to be done in two pieces because the insurance won't pay for the sleep study and nap test that's ultimately needed uh because they want to prove that it's not something else first so you do the overnight sleep study you go into the sleep lab um just so many teeny tiny wires and electrodes <laughs> sort of put all over your scalp worked into the hair um and then a few sort of around the face because one of the things they have to track is your eye movement uh mm -hmm. so electrodes in the areas that uh the eye muscles are attached to and then um a breathing tube that's actually attached to a sensor to tell how much you're breathing so it's instead of putting air in it's tracking the air coming out um and then there's on limbs and chest i think a uh, uh what's the heart one ekg mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and so they monitor your sleep for the night and you're in a completely controlled environment um they give you i think seven hours to fall asleep and they're tracking how much you move they're looking for restless leg they're looking for how much you breathe because that's how you diagnose sleep apnea and once that's done if everyone feels confident that uh, nothing there throws up any red flags that would explain the excessive daytime sleepiness otherwise. Um, then you get to do the night over again and then do a nap test the next day. So that's at the end of the nap. So at the end of the, the night, the, the full night's rest, because that's also the control to make sure that the, the nap stuff isn't affected by you not getting enough sleep the night before. Um, you lose all of the other stuff except for all the electrodes on the head and they're attached to a little box that you get to carry around with you all day. Um, but again, no caffeine, no stimulants, um, no meds. And um, they wake you up. You have to stay awake for two hours. And then you lay down and try to sleep for 30 minutes. And then at the end of the 30 minutes, they wake you back up and then you have to stay awake for two hours. And then we repeat this at least four naps um, if at the end of the four, they've got at least two that show really clear signs, um, because what they're looking for is how long it takes you to fall asleep in general, and then how quickly you fall into REM sleep, because a uh, neurotypical brain, when you fall asleep, um, it'll take you at least like 20 to 30 minutes to go into REM sleep. So you wouldn't do that during um, a and, nap, right? Yeah, so you wouldn't do that during the nap, um, or you might, but like way at the end i think the i think what they're looking for is a 15 minute cutoff so they want to see if you do that within 15 minutes um of falling asleep and then if you don't have a good definitive answer at the end of four you have to do a fifth one um <laughs> this most recent one they did so i got a clinical diagnosis um almost two years ago, but I didn't actually do the sleep study until the end of last year because the insurance was like, okay, we paid for your medication for a year. And now we want you to like, go get the lab test done to prove that you really have the thing so we can continue. Uh, to their credit, they did at least completely cover the cost of the sleep study. So that was nice. Um, but yeah, we had, I, the technician had talked to me about like, it'll either be four or five and we'll be able to tell you. Um, so when I woke up from the fourth one, I was like, so do I have to do a fifth? And she was like, oh, no, no, oh. You're, you're going home. Oh. Um, you, you definitely have it. Yeah, yeah you're, you're terrible. Not good. 
considering considering that um so when you lay down they have to they have to do um you know they have to plug the box back in and then do a little calibration test to make sure nothing got knocked loose and that all of the eye movement gets tracked properly um so like you're laying down the room's already dark but they need you to do up down side to side like it's maybe 30 whole seconds and i actually started falling asleep during one of those on one of the last two tests oh no because keeping yourself awake for two hours in a room by yourself sucks yeah um that's across the board everyone that i've talked to that had to go through one of those like we all agree like no this is just the worst um okay i have a and so like uh so, uh-huh. Sorry, I was going to say, yeah, I have a question about that. Because you're saying, like, you're mm-hmm. alone in a room and you had to keep yourself awake for two hours. But, like, you just told us that, like, you would fall asleep in classes where, like, you were obviously engaged with and interested in the material. So, like, yeah. like what happens if you can't keep yourself awake for those two-hour spaces? Uh, so, basically like you know i i took stuff with me and i learned this lesson after the first one because i did one of these you know 10 years ago and i had taken something to read i think with me and then a few other things um and pretty quickly discovered that sitting and reading is not going to cut it and so for the second one especially because i was just so exhausted i'd been doing all of this like creative work all year and you know, the week leading up to it, I couldn't take any of my stimulants or my sleep aid. So I'd had just horrible sleep all week long. I was exhausted. I was basically, you know how toddlers just get super cranky when they're really (laughs) tired and then it's past their bedtime. That was me. That was me in the car with my roommate driving me to the place because I wasn't safe to drive. And like, I got there and I was just like, everything is terrible. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I took, I like specifically took several projects uh like crochet projects and i think i even just took like some coloring stuff i was just like i'm not i'm not gonna try to get anything productive done here none of this is anything that matters at all um and yeah and i mean just played games on my phone for a while because like that's really crucial and uh i've actually talked to one person who said that they were wired up for their test in some places they can actually keep you wired up in between tests and that must have been one of those because he said he uh, he was sitting in a chair, sitting upright, eyes open, reading and dozed off in the middle of that two hour period. And like the technicians like suddenly were looking at the readings and going, whoa, 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 what happened? They had to go in and wake him up. <laughs> oh, no. um, but yeah, like it is possible to learn to sleep with your eyes open. I did not get good at it, but I got okay. <laughs> Um, mostly I just got really good at, um, sort of holding myself in a way so that if I started to slouch because I was losing muscle tone because I'd fallen asleep, um, I wouldn't fall. (laughs) So there was a lot of, a lot of this and a Mm -hmm. lot of, you know, um, and it actually, it ended up being the weirdest problem in college because I started noticing that the classes I was falling asleep in the most often were my favorite ones. It was the professors that I really loved. And I realized I was forgetting to focus on staying awake because what they were saying was actually engaging, which meant I ended up having this little ritual once a semester where I would have to go wait after class and go quietly talk to the professor and say, I know this is going to sound like the lamest excuse you have ever heard for anything in your life. Um, but I have this thing. Um, I really can't control Like, I'm, I'm just really tired all the time. And I haven't figured out what it's about yet. Um, but I usually will like doodle or like I take really copious notes. Um, and I, uh, I forget to actively stay awake in your class because you're so engaging. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, so I got to do that. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, like, cause this started, so my last two years of high school were actually at the university of North Texas for a, a program up there, a dual credit program. So like this started when I was, you know, one of these nerdy kids that was in college early. Um, so, you know, some of the professors already thought we were really weird. Um, But at least, you know, for the most part, like I said, it was my favorite professors. And a lot of them, the reason they're my favorite professors was because they were a reasonable kind of person. And so 
all of them were, you know, were understanding about it. Some were definitely more confused than others. Um, but like one of the last ones was uh, the woman teaching me C++ in business school who, I mean, she was so sweet because she was just really concerned and just like, are you, are you like, have you seen a doctor about that? Because that sounds really serious. And I was like, yeah, I'm kind of working on it. Like I'm going to have to wait till school's out, but yeah. Um, so yeah, that just kind of made my life real difficult. And I did, uh, you know, I went to a GP who had me try just some standard sleep aids because we were, because I was like, well, like I have these really vivid dreams and I end up waking up feeling really tired, but like, I know I've been thinking a lot all night. Um, and you know, it was sort of, well, we can try some sleep aids, but those are usually to help you fall asleep and that's not the problem. Um, but it turns out that's actually another thing that's really common among people with narcolepsy is we all have these extremely vivid dreams um, frequently um, those hypnagogic hallucinations will, will be very frightening. Um, it, not across the board. Mine usually aren't. They're usually something more whimsical. Um, but for some people, especially combined with sleep paralysis at night, um, people will wake up feeling like there's someone in their house. Um, and, you know, so they're like, you know, complete with like hearing banging on the door or breaking glass or something. And then, you know, they'll wake up, they'll panic, can't move. Um, and then, you know, really wake up and go, oh, oh, okay, it's fine. But like, that's not a good way to get a full night's sleep. No, no. Then your body's full of adrenaline. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're ready to go fight somebody. And I've heard, is this something you saw in your research? I've heard that some of that is um, credited with like uh, reports of alien abductions and stuff like that. Yes, yes. Um, because again, that, that the sleep paralysis, so a lot of alien abduction stories, um, you know, like you feel like there's someone there with you and you can't move. So clearly you've been paralyzed. Um, so yeah, a lot of alien abduction stories can very easily be explained away. And sleep paralysis is actually something that isn't uh, exclusive to narcolepsy. The only one of that, that major tetrad that is, is cataplexy. Like you really don't see that anywhere else. Um, but yeah, excessive daytime sleepiness can be tied to all kinds of things. Um, and then the sleep paralysis is something that happens to most people at some point in their life. Um, just, you know, like maybe once or twice and not on the reg. Um, <laughs> and then those hypnogosinines, like that is a thing that can happen to people. Um, it's just not very common. Sure. Again, I th like, yeah, I think I've a maybe lot... one time in yeah. high school after, like, you know, like two nights of barely any <laughs> sleep, you yeah. know, something like and that. That's yeah. The thing. Like anyone who's experienced severe sleep deprivation has probably experienced one or more of those other things. It's just that the cataplexy doesn't usually hit other people. Yeah. Hmm. So, okay. So I think you did a fantastic job describing like the symptomology and you talked a little bit about management and like the things that your GP described that are prescribed that weren't uh, good. Like, can you talk a little bit about like like ways that narcolepsy is managed? Like, yeah. So, uh, so again, they know what the actual causes like, or maybe not the full mechanism, but they know like there's this there's this chemical transmitter that's not that that for whatever reason people's narcolepsy don't have um, enough of in their brain. So it's fully within the brain system. So part of the challenge of figuring out a way to basically introduce more cretin uh into the brain is that like you have to pass the blood brain barrier so there's there are people trying to figure out how to do that but you know this is one in two thousand people in the population sure. uh, is affected with narcolepsy so it's a so it's one of those things that falls into the category of orphan drug research uh meaning that the various governments will try to kind of help out uh but at the moment what that's mostly produced is some novel uh stimulants and uh really, really what I like to call my industrial strength sleep aid. Um, so yeah, the treatment options, um, the the first ones obviously are just stimulants. So amphetamines have been prescribed forever, sort of since it's been recognized as, uh, as a thing. Um, there's also a drug called uh, modafinil that uh, other people will recognize. Um, it's also used for uh, shift work uh disorder uh basically just meaning anyone that's really having trouble staying awake during the day um 
or staying awake during the time they need to be awake because of whatever reason and shift work is obviously one and that's actually now the preferred either modafinil or armodafinil is now the preferred uh sort of emergency backup medication for uh the air force when we really need our people to be awake right um because they used to use amphetamines <laughs> um, yeah. can yeah. be problematic and it's the same kind yeah. of yeah, and it's actually the same kind of stimulants that are used for ADHD. So, like, I'm actually on one of the amphetamines because uh, I've got some contraindications on the modafinil, um, which, to be fair, is also, like, when he first prescribed it to me, when because I tried modafinil, you know, 10 years ago after that original sleep study, which I was borderline narcolepsy, so I didn't quite meet that numerical thing i didn't quite hit that 15 minute mark i think i was you know hitting rem sleep at 20 minutes which is still not normal but it's not <laughs> enough for the insurance company um but at the time he was like uh yeah you you really you shouldn't drink alcohol while you're on this and um and it uh because it can it can damage your liver if you're also drinking while you're on it and it can also um interfere with hormonal birth control and so i went to look it up and it was really new at the time and like all of the all of the stuff about it was like yeah we still aren't really sure what the mechanism is and i'm going the fda approves stuff when they don't know the mechanism so i went back and looked it up within the last year still says the same thing they still don't actually know quite how it works like it's a dopamine reuptake inhibitor but it's a it's a selective one so it the net result is it does help with wakefulness and has fewer other side effects uh, than the amphetamines, because the amphetamines are just kind of nope. We're keeping all the dopamines in the blood all in the bloodstream as long as we can. Um, but that can also like that's also part of why uh, it can become addictive. Uh, fortunately, apparently, the part of the brain that like one of the things that hypercretin does is it helps uh, sort of direct dopamine to the right places when it's released. And uh, with less hypocretin, you get less uh, less precise dopamine reactions, which uh, ultimately means that people with narcolepsy are going to be less prone to addiction. So that's oh, cool, cool, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, Silver they've lining. actually yeah <laughs> yeah they've actually been using that uh, for research into treatment for addiction, um, figuring out like oh is there a way that we could intentionally block hypocretins to to help people with addiction. Hmm. Um, but yeah, um, there's that, there's a new drug called Sinosi, um, that is also a nephron dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it, but it's another one that basically like helps with wakefulness without doing, because what caffeine does is there's a chemical in your brain that builds up, uh, that makes you sleepy. Um don't remember what it's called and I don't remember which page it's on um but basically that builds up over the day so is that melatonin at night, mm -mm, melatonin no. is the signal that tells you it's time to sleep right okay that's the that's the traffic conductor that tells you to go that way uh adenosine builds up in the brain um while you're awake and then at night you process it and the reason why you can wake up still feeling tired if you don't get a full night's sleep is that your brain hasn't fully processed it so you still have some of yesterday's adenosine in your system and now you're building up more and the way the caffeine works is it blocks the receptors that the adenosine hits so basically it stops your brain from feeling weirdness but that adenosine keeps building up behind the blockage and then once the caffeine wears off woof, you get hit with that whole wave uh, so that's where the caffeine crash comes from. So the that upside so to those sense. other stimulants is you don't get that. Um, but yeah. So you've got all of the various wakefulness drugs. Um, the part of the brain that, um, yeah, the, the part of the brain that the hypercretin works in um, is also is also affected by their certain antidepressants um, that sort of work the serotonin system i don't remember what the exact details of that are i was never very good at like the microbiology stuff like both of my parents were biology teachers my sister is a geneticist and i'm just like 
biochemistry and microbiology is just too detailed. Like I get how the organs work, but once <laughs> you get to a smaller level. So like, this has been my own special hell because I'm just like, <laughs> I need to understand these things and they're too abstract. Um, so I've been having to kind of go through them very slowly. Um, but yeah, so there are certain um, antidepressants that can actually help with the mechanism that's basically short circuiting to cause cataplexy. Um, and including some of the older ones, like the tricyclic antidepressants are actually some of the better ones, uh, for oh. that particular purpose. Um, yeah. And then the, the really big one that's, uh, become sort of a, a frontline treatment over the last, I think, decade is called Zyrum. And that's that, uh, industrial strength sleep aid. Uh, it is a highly controlled substance because it is GHB, <laughs> the date rape drug, um, and uh, the way that works is it basically will force you into a deep sleep. Um, so it'll sort of overpower that malfunctioning switch that wants to jump between levels so that you actually get deep sleep for a while and then you kind of come back out of it. Um, the way that it works, it has to be in a liquid form. Um, so dosing is, is tr tricky and then also if you take enough to knock you out for a full eight hours, you will stop breathing. So you have to take a four hour dose, set an alarm, wake up in the middle of the night and take a second four hour dose. Oh, wow. Um, which is super cool when you're uh, with like other people, if you're on vacation and you're sharing a hotel room or whatever, uh, figuring out how to set up those alarms so that you don't wake up anyone else in the room with you. And it's still um, wild that like you still don't get a full eight hours of uninterrupted sleep this way, right? Like it's, it's obviously much better well, than without, but like. So the way that the sleep cycle works, that actually works out um, because you repeat a 90 minute cycle multiple times. Mm -hmm. So actually waking up in the middle of it isn't a huge deal because um, mm -hmm. you're naturally gonna have a wake up period in there somewhere anyway. Mm -hmm. But the critical thing is that you can get a couple of full cycles in each four hour block. Um, yeah. I guess so, I forget that other people wake up in the middle of the night. Sorry, I sleep literally like a mm -hmm. rock and that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, they've actually, uh, studying some uh some of the like non-industrialized cultures have found that basically like the siesta model is our natural model like there's a point in the afternoon where the body wants to take a nap um and so like we they've even done some studies on uh mediterranean cultures that used to do that and then sort of stopped over the last 20 to 30 years and have seen a very specific decline in certain health factors because they stopped doing those naps yeah hmm. sleep science is really fascinating and slightly terrifying because basically like modern lifestyles are killing us slowly because we're not getting enough sleep <laughs> i don't think that's the only reason but yeah <laughs> it's a surprisingly big one though because yeah. you know it affects everything it affects your blood pressure it affects your immune system it affects uh, memory. So you'll see people who, you know, swear their whole lives that they can get by on three or four hours of sleep at night. And then they end up with really debilitating memory loss at the end of their life. And, you know, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher's are two really public examples of like these people who bragged that they didn't need to sleep and then just their brains just self-destructed at the end. Um, oh, interesting. Which is just tragic. Because you've got these people that, you know, they're like, I'm too busy to sleep. Because people act like sleep is a bad thing. And it's mm -hmm. not. It's the place where our minds... Because basically what happens is all of your memories from the day, everything you took in gets taken out and sort of sorted. And then, so the... I'm trying to remember which steps. It's the, the, the deep sleep is the point at which you're basically sort of defragging. Like you're... Your, all the all the memories of the day are sort of being sorted. These I think defragging is a reference that, that ages you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, wow. it's, what it, it's what it sounds like, though. The description, because you're basically, you're, you're having to move little bits at a time because you've got limited storage space. And so the brain sort of moves some of them around. And in REM sleep, you, you know, your brain starts sort of making connections and filing things in particular places. 
And then you go back and repeat that multiple times. And so like earlier in the night, you'll see more deep sleep. And then usually you'll, it'll be heavier on the REM sleep at the end. So that's like the critical place where a lot of your connections and a lot of your sort of memory filing happens. So if you cut your sleep short, that's what you're depriving yourself of. Um, but that's why you're working on something either like practicing a skill or um, like working to solve a problem uh, sort of late at night and you put it down and you get a full night's sleep and you wake up in the morning and you got it. That's why, because your brain has finished the work for you. Um, and that's why, you know, they kept trying to tell us in college, like, no, staying up all night and cramming is not the way to learn the material. You will not do better. <laughs> You won't because your brain doesn't hold on to it because you forgot to sleep the night before the exam. So your recall is going to be compromised. So you don't, you mentioned something. So when you, you mentioned staying in a hotel room with somebody else. So I guess uh, to me that, that, I don't know, that it prompted me to think, uh, is there something that you feel like people who are around people who have narcolepsy, like spouses and friends, is there something that you wish they knew or you you think would be helpful to kind of get the word out to all the neurotypicals out there? Yeah, um, there's a few things. Uh, one is, you know, sort of popular culture has sort of painted this picture of narcolepsy that's really inaccurate. Um, and it's actually, I found that it actually is fairly similar to the way that Tourette's is treated. Um, and like, I had a friend in college with Tourette's and like, I got to see what a struggle that was for him because he had to be excruciatingly vigilant about what he said consciously, because that would sort of set the tone for what would come out in a tick. So like, he never swore ever, ever, ever. Don't ask him to. It's not funny. Just don't do it. Uh, cause he needs to not do that in a professional setting. Um, and so it's the same sort of just general awareness of like, you know, I'll have people sort of make these offhanded jokes about like, oh man, it must be nice to just get to sleep whenever you want. And it's like, no, I'll spend 16 hours in a 24 hour period sleeping and I'll still feel like I only slept for two. Like... I will wake up more tired than when I went to sleep or the ones that really suck are like, cause like I said, the dreams are really, really vivid. So even if it's just something fairly mundane, like I'll still wake up feeling like I've been doing whatever that thing is. The other day I had a dream that I was bored. Like there was one morning <laughs> that I had a day off. <laughs> I couldn't wake up. Like I couldn't get out of bed. And when I, when I rolled over and was like, okay, I'll sleep another 30 minutes. The dream that I had was that I was bored. And at that point I was like, I am done with this sleep. I'm done. And like, <laughs> I got up just to get the fuck away from that stupid dream. Um, but there have also been times when I had these extremely vivid, like nightmares that are, uh, you know, like basically war zones or something really horrible happening, you know, just, just really frightening and i mean like intellectually frightening too not just like jump scares um and like you know stuff that's really disturbing and i'll wake up like i can wake myself up now usually but then as soon as i go back to sleep it's like i just hit pause and i go right back foot and i'm like i need to be sleeping but i don't want to be and i'd actually without realizing it in college had um gotten to a point where those dreams were so regular that I would intentionally stay up um, and we had a little sort of insomnia club because there were a few of us that for one reason or another couldn't sleep at night and so we'd stay up all night just dorking around in the dorm and I would basically wait until I was so exhausted that when I did finally sleep I didn't have those dreams mm -hmm. and it actually turns out like I said before like the the deep sleep phase is the heavy one when you first go to sleep when you're sleep deprived, when you when you have a bad backlog, um, your body will recover the deep sleep first. So like I wasn't dreaming much the first couple nights. And so I basically spend two weeks barely sleeping. And then I get a good three or four days of useful sleep um, before the cycle started again. Wow. Yikes. Yeah. So that's one thing is like the people sort of joking about like, cause they just misunderstand it. Cause they hear like, you know, I'm sleepy all the time. I'm like, no, I'm 
in the middle of things I want to be doing. So one of the diagnostic tools um, that's used early on is the at birth sleepiness scale. And it's basically just a list of questions. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah. Um, and it's eight questions or eight situations. And then you rate it z zero, one, three. Zero is would never doze. One is slight chance of dozing. Two is moderate chance of dozing. Three is high chance of dozing. And it's really kind of telling the things that are on this list because first one, while sitting and reading. Okay. Yeah. Pretty mm -hmm. high chance of dozing, right? Watching TV. For a lot of people, you'd be a little more active there. But again, it's one of those you're sitting, it's, it's low stakes. So yeah, you might not think anything of dozing off. Sitting inactive in a public place, like in a theater or a meeting. Yeah, pretty high chance I'm going to doze there too. And like, that's a problem. Because, you know, work meetings, like that's bad. Um, four, as a passenger in a car for an hour. For me, that's still a three every time. Like I have trained myself to fall asleep when I'm a passenger in any kind of vehicle. I used to be able to sleep on the band bus like a champ. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> on the band bus? You know, when I No. <laughs> yeah, because like we'd have one seat that was just filled up with like uniforms and instruments yeah. and um, just enough space for a person. I could just kind of lean on it and sleep the whole way, no problem. Mm. But like when I travel with friends, when we're flying somewhere, I will take the middle seat because I will bring my little neck pillow and some earbuds and just, I got to wear, cause when I was at North Texas, I was flying home to Houston on our closed weekends. And so about once a month I was flying home and then back again on a Southwest flight. And like, it was a 45 minute flight from wheels up to wheels down. And I got to where I would fall asleep as we backed out of the gate. And then when we touched down and decelerated, I'd wake right back up. I trained myself. So like, yeah, sure, I guess that's cool. But then um, five is lying down to rest in the afternoon. Well, yeah, okay. Like that's, if you're lying down to rest, you want to sleep, right? Unless you have to lie down to rest, which is the situation <laughs> for a lot of us. Um, six is sitting quietly after a non-alcoholic lunch. Um, seven, sitting and chatting to someone. And the thought that there are people in the world for whom that is like, there are people whose narcolepsy is much worse than mine who will literally in the middle of a conversation not off. And I have found myself when I'm like with a group of people and I'm not like a central focus and I'm not that involved in the conversation, I'll start to not off. Um, to the point that even like when we're playing, like I make sure I take a small dose of my stimulant before we start because I don't want to get drowsy halfway through. Well, especially because um, among other things, it a makes Zoom it call. To focus. Yeah, a Zoom call is so much more difficult to focus on than like if we were all sitting at the mm -hmm. same table, right? So yeah, I totally understand yeah. that. Yeah, but like, even I... in person, for heroes of uh, for heroes of awesome, I'll sometimes I'll sit there and just sort of zone out. So like I, that's why I always have tea with me on both of those, is because like that's that's green tea. That's a little bit of caffeine, just giving me a little. Mm -hmm. little kick um and of course the last one number eight is the reason that i finally sought medical help was because it's in a car while stopped for a few minutes in traffic and i started dozing off at stoplights and my commute at that time because i was living with my parents like inland galveston county and driving to galveston island it was a 35 to 45 minute commute and there were a couple times that I caught myself dozing off in traffic. And the other thing that's really scary is getting to the office and realizing, like, I don't remember my commute. Oh. I know I got here. I don't remember it happening. Now it's really repetitive. So it's the kind of thing that your brain is not going to put a high priority on remembering. But, like, automatic behaviors are another thing that's common, again, with people who are sleep deprived, but also there for people with narcolepsy. And that just basically means like you go through the motions of doing something that's so common that you can literally do it in your sleep. So people will talk about, cause sometimes that's fine. It just means like you get up and make your coffee in the morning without really being conscious. But sometimes it means you get up and make your coffee, but instead of putting creamer in, you put orange juice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or, you know, you're, you end up putting something in the wash that shouldn't go in or you know, just there's there's all kinds of little things that can go really badly wrong, because especially if you're dealing with medications and there are lots of people with narcolepsy who have children. So then suddenly, like, you've got your automatic behaviors getting involved when you're just living your life with your kids. That's terrifying. Right. Um, 
so yeah that's that was sort of the the last one that was a big red flag um because that's dangerous like at that point yeah. you are endangering your life and the lives of others yeah mm. <laughs> well Thank you so much for sharing all of this really interesting, cool stuff. I know you, you joke all the time that you're a science enthusiast, but like this was just as thorough and in depth as like any one of us sharing our expertise. Like you obviously have learned a lot and yeah. it's very interesting to hear about. And also we appreciate the fact that you were opening up and sharing a vulnerability because this is all about you and your experience. Yeah. So. Uh, for whatever reason, I've never been super shy about talking about that kind of stuff. And I feel like... I can use that for good. Uh, so I do. Um, and also just like, it turns out that sleep science is really fascinating. Um, <laughs> it's kind of right up there with some of the stuff that Brian was talking about with, uh, with fungi. Like it's just not as well understood as you would think it is, as you would expect. Um, there was actually, it was kind of funny because, uh, he'd mentioned the, the sleep behavior of oh. a particular kind of ant. And that sort of piqued my interest because in the stuff I've read, because uh, one of the books I read was about sleep in general and talked about how sleep is different among different uh, kinds of animals. Um, there are a bunch of animals and especially birds who can sleep with half of their brain at a time. Mm -hmm. So if you see a flock of birds all up in a line somewhere sleeping, the ones at the end literally have one eye open and that half of their brain is awake while the other half and at some point in the night they will turn around so that the other half can also swap the only and, time that they have to be all in is during rem sleep and uh, marine mammals do that because like if you think about a dolphin or a whale or something like they can't stop to sleep entirely because they have to keep consciously coming up to the surface for breathing so yeah, yeah. I, I think they're that basically super cool. they're basically still yeah they're trying to figure out how like I think the sort of assumption at this point is they must just have a different type of REM sleep and we haven't found it yet. Um, the, the animals that live both on land and water, so like seals, actually will dream on land, but not in the water. Oh, oh. wow. Cool. That's... It's super cool. Like there's just, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really, really wild stuff. And um, yeah, there've been three books in particular that, uh, that I really enjoyed uh, that have been really useful. The first one was actually uh, called Wide Awake and Dreaming. And now I can't remember, it's Fleischer, I think, but it's it's actually a memoir from a woman who has narcolepsy uh, and who got diagnosed during college. Um, and so that's that one is especially just the the similarities to my own story were just really sort of illuminating and scary because um, there's a lot of and it's been kind of nice because this time around I like made sure and found like a narcolepsy support group um, and so getting to hear other people tell stories that are just the same you know um, a lot of us deal with brain fog and that can come out in a lot of different ways because again it's the way that your brain gets when you're really sleep deprived so you know a lot of times I'll just kind of lose words or just can't recall something or a really fun one that like other people have also described is like I go to say a specific word and when it comes out in my head I said the word and then someone else is like no you said this other thing and I was like no I said and then I'll repeat it and it's still the wrong word only this time I notice um there's actually an instance of that on the Star Trek stream uh I got the names of the characters kids mixed up at one point um and like Jordan is correcting me because i like what i what i said in my head was right to be wow. fair the um, their the romulans kids names were con confusing anyway yeah but De Cilo and delimi yeah, <laughs> yeah like mm -hmm. but it was like i like i literally had the name written down in front of me like i'd kept the notes in front of me to keep them straight and i still like i was looking at it and said what i was reading but it was the wrong one Interesting. um and then the other two books um sleepyhead by henry nichols uh, is like, he's actually, he also actually has narcolepsy. Um, so he started off to write a book about narcolepsy and then sort of was persuaded to broaden it a little bit and talk about sleep in general. But there's a lot you can learn about how sleep is supposed to work based on how narcolepsy makes it not work. Um, and then the one that's sort of more technical is why we unlocking the power of sleep and dreams by Matthew Walker, who is a researcher at UC Berkeley, I think. 
Um, and so that one is, that one gets a lot more into the science, but that's the one where they talk about like the different way that animals sleep. Cause among other things, they're trying to trace, you know, how far back does sleep go evolutionarily? And like, there are worms that have recognizable sleep cycles. Um, what'd so, yeah. you say the name of the third book was? Um, why we sleep and what? the author is Matthew Walker. Yeah. So, and those are all, especially sleepyhead is really accessible. Um, and then why we sleep is a little drier and it was actually amusing for some reason I was going through the Amazon reviews and there were a lot of people like complaining that like it's scare tactics. And it's like, no, he's just giving you a very <laughs> honest description of how your body breaks down when you don't get enough sleep because mm -hmm. it does. And that's important. <laughs> <laughs> don't mess with brain stuff yeah yeah well and just the the description of uh hypocretin in both books and explaining all the things that it does is just kind of wild and it's one of the few systems in the human brain that doesn't really have a good redundancy system mm -hmm. so like there are other things that when they break down your brain can kind of work around it but mm -hmm. not that one hmm. gracious well, that's really interesting yeah this has all been super cool yeah. um i don't want to cut us off because i feel like there's so much more we could talk about <laughs> but we've been here for a while um so thank yeah. you so much for talking to us about yourself i'm sorry we didn't do a nature chat for you earlier but we like having you on the show no it's fine i actually uh, it worked out because uh, a lot of this research i've done very recently mm, so well, it worked go. out um well, it's been fabulous yeah. thanks for condensing it for us <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so thank you both for being here and thanks to everyone who's watching and listening. We like doing these nature chats. Um, we'll have some more guests on very soon. I have a big long list of guests and we're working our way through them. Um, I'm excited because uh, at the end of the terrible fight with the Ambrosids, um, the four uh, characters, uh, Lucianus, Cedric, Fletcher, and Kay leveled up to level three. Uh, so Ooh. when y'all see us again in July, which hopefully this will be out before then, they'll have leveled up and we'll be on to new adventures. So thanks everybody out there. Uh, we appreciate you following along on our adventures and thanks for being interested in the people behind the characters too. Uh, so we'll see you later.